Okay, chapter two is entitled American Experiments, and the era is 1521 to 1700. This is the very early colonization era in, in the Americas. Okay, so this chapter is about colonization. So chapter one, we talked about how the three cultures got here. They collided with each other from the time of European contact and exploration. Uh, the Native Americans were here. The Europeans, the white Europeans came and they brought Africans with them as a slave source. Okay, so these three people are very important to understand in our story. Their interactions and contributions will continue throughout American history, even to the present day. Okay, so chapter two is about the early attempts at European colonization in the Americas. Okay, so what does colonization mean exactly? It's not really a friendly visit. It's not like let's let's go to new kind of tropical places and start start a new culture society. It's not like that at all. It's the action or process of settling among and establishing control over the indigenous people of an area. Also appropriating a place or domain for one's or typically a country's own use. So it's not really a nice thing. You you uh, a mother country in this case, well down the road it'll be England. But, it, but other, others do it too. France and, and the Dutch do it and Russia and a lot of European uh, countries get involved in, the, in coloniz colonizing um, the Americas. OK, so you see a land with opportunity. And what, what, what do I mean by that? I mean, raw resources, goods, some kind of some, some kind of source to to get a, the mother country goods that they can create into manufactured goods that, that they can sell for profit, okay? So in the Americas, it might be lumber, might be tobacco, might be sugar, it would be cotton, uh, indigo for ink, things like that, okay? So you're talking about getting things out of the land. So what is that what does that require you to have? A labor source, okay? So when you when you're colonizing, you're looking for a, a, a country or a land to collect raw goods, and you're looking for a source of labor to exploit. So you're you're taking the, the goods out of the out of the land, and you're and you're typically not always, but typically enslaving and dominating and subjugating the people that are there to be your labor source. Okay, because you want to get these raw goods to ship back to the mother country. So they so the mother country can take those raw goods and manufacture them into into goods they can sell for for profit. Okay. Okay. So chapter two is also about the introduction of the institution of slavery or what's called chattel slavery. So chattel is a word that means that your property. A person has the legal status of property, so it can be bought and sold. Okay. Uh, so if you're a slave, you're you're like a like a wagon, it's the same thing. Property it doesn't matter that you that you got blood coursing through you and you breathe. You're not seen as a person. You're not seen as a as a human. You're seen as an inferior species that's that that's to be enslaved. Okay, so chattel means that your property can be bought and sold. Okay, so this is an interesting uh, quote from your book, page forty. Talks about how the laws regarding servitude were changed from English law. And this comment, all children born in this country shall be held in bondage or free only according to the condition of the mother. OK, so just a sidebar here, I just kind of explain why I've got certain words in brackets here. This is kind of a kind of a writing lesson. OK, when, when you are uh, quoting a source, you, you never want to correct it. So if it's if something's misspelled or whatever it might be, bad grammar, whatever it is, you don't correct it, but but you simply notify your reader that you're aware of it. So when you see the when you see the letters SIC in brackets, SIC is a Latin word sick that means just as, or that's how it really appears in the original. So you, you see the word shall be there. That that's not how we spell it today. It, it may have been how they spelled it back then. And they may have used that word back then. If you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, that's that's the history of words. You can look up a word and, and go back hundreds of years to see how it how it originated and kind of how it how it was modified over the years. So all I'm saying saying to you, I I put the S I C in the brackets to point out to you that that word shall be is misspelled. Okay. When I put in bondage, I, I'm adding that for clarification. So the original quote said. 
All children born in this country shall be held or free only according to, to the condition of the mother. In those days, everyone knew what, what, what held or free meant, slave or free. But we don't because we don't live in the world of slavery anymore. So I, I add the words in bondage, and I put it in brackets to tell you that I added it. So you know what I'm talking about, okay? Okay, so, so, so this idea of following the condition of the mother... This runs contrary to patriarchal English law. Uh, in, in, in English law, a child's status was always derived from the father. It's a male-dominated society. The, 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 the men were more important, so a child was always connected to the father. Okay. Uh, so, But here in America, they change it to the mother. Now, why would they do that? Uh, it's unusual for, for people to change a law like that when it had been in use for years. And especially, you're, you're a new colony. You've got all the challenges in the world. Now you're going to rewrite the law book? I mean, bring the law book with you and keep it the same. That's one thing off your checklist, okay? Survival, finding food, finding water is more important. But they changed this law. So why, why did they do that? You know, it's complicated change law. So what about being an American made them made the English change this law? Why change from the father to the mother? Okay. Well, if you could go back in time and visit a plantation in the Americas, United what would become the United States, the South, of uh, the 17th and 18th centuries, and uh, 19th also, uh, for half of it anyway. On a large plantation, you might have hundreds of slaves. And if you looked at, at the at the slave population, you'll see that many of them are mixed race. So obviously people with, with lighter skin, okay? Uh, so where do they come from? Well, this, this is a practice in the South and that, that happened throughout the uh, years of slavery. The plantation owners or their sons or other male family members would procreate with their female slaves to create other slaves. Why? Because slaves are expensive. So you can make your own for free. Why not? Okay. I mean, it makes its business sense, right? Well, I'm using the word procreate as a nice term here to mean rape. Of course, these women didn't have any say in the matter. And most of them were, were, were taken, you know, at, at the will of the plantation owner and their, and their male family members. Okay. This, this is not an unusual thing that happens. Uh, this is perfectly legal to do. Slaves were property, had no rights. So a man could do whatever he wanted to, to his slaves. Murder them, rape them, no law against it. Nobody would arrest you for that, okay? Uh, so, so what was that like for the, for the slaves? There, it, this, this affects a lot of people, okay? So I'm going to show you a short film here. Um, so go ahead and take a, take a break here, pause the video, and go and watch the film entitled Enslaved. African rape scene, okay? And then when you're finished, come back. Okay, so for those of you who recognized her, the woman uh, that's being uh, raped in this movie was is Mariah Carey. This is from the movie The Butler, 2013. Okay. Uh, so so this is this is the way this is the way it was. It, if you were a slave, whether you were a you know a, a man, a woman, a child didn't matter. Your your everyday life was psychological warfare to try to stay out of the white people's way because if you didn't, you might be punished, you might be raped, you might be killed, as you see in the in the film clip. Okay, but but think about the how how it affects each person. Okay, the the woman who's being violated and taken at at you know against her will at any any time of the day. Of course, she lives in this in this utter fear of this happening, when will it happen again? Um, she has to submit. She can't say no. There's no one to turn to. There's no law that will protect her. Uh, her own people can't protect her because they'll be killed, as, as you see in the movie. So she she has to go along. The, her husband, who, of course, you know, can't really stop this white man from doing this, he has to just put up with it and look the other way. Of course, the child too young to understand all this, is angry, angry at the man taking his mother, angry at, her, at his father for not protecting her. So he, in the film, he, he yells at his father, do something. 
So the father, you know, realizes, of course, I, I probably should do something. I'm a man. I should protect my my wife. He he uh, goes to the owner, and you see what happens. He gets killed for even just bringing it up. Okay. So, but another person to also look at in this film is the is the white uh, wife of the plantation owner. She can hear it. She can hear what's going on. She knows what's going on. So this was a this is a a practice that was done in many of these plantations and it affected really every everybody okay so so for sex is one way to create more slaves that you didn't have to pay for because they were expensive but but make no mistake about it it wasn't just all business it was also for the pleasure of the man doing it okay many of the plantation owners saw their wives as very pious and and uh kind of above them spiritually and sex wasn't something that, that they saw themselves dealing with someone so pure. So they would only turn to their wives for sex to create children. Uh, and they put their wives on pedestals and saw them as above, above them spiritually. As far as their sexual needs and desires, they would go to the slave shacks to, to do whatever they wanted. Okay, so kind of a... This is this is kind of the way it was. Now, do I mean every single plantation, every single plantation owner? No, not not even close. But more than we'd like to like to think. Okay, this was this was not an unusual practice. Okay, uh, okay. So female slaves were encouraged to have babies in any way they could, and to create more slaves. And and in in many cases, in most cases, that this didn't bother them. I don't I don't mean the being raped part, but it, being pregnant didn't bother them because it meant that they didn't have to work so hard. They could be taken out of the fields in the last month or two of their pregnancy, depending on how on how benevolent the owner was, and and they could they could have some time off. Okay, uh, okay. So going back to our our comment, our quote here. By creating a law that said the condition of a child follows the condition of the mother, uh, what does that mean? In other words, if your mother was a slave, so were you. It didn't matter that your father was white. If your mother was black, so were you. Uh, so how do we define black? In those days, it was called the one drop rule. If, if it could be determined that you had one drop of black blood, you were considered black. didn't matter that you, that you appeared to be white. If if they could if someone could find you know a black ancestor in your lineage, you were black. That meant you were a slave. Okay. If it was proven that you had any kind of African descent in the American South, you were considered to be black and a slave. So by changing this old English law, it made it easier for the white man responsible for fathering this child to ignore or and turn his back on his own child because in his mind. It was just business. This is just a piece of property. It's chattel. It's like a wagon. It's, it's like a, a rake. It's like a shovel. It's just a piece of property that, that I you know created because I needed more. Uh, so you can turn your back on your own child. So if the child had black blood, and of course they did, it was seen that the child was born from a slave woman, also slave. They were property, had no rights, considered to be inferior, even though it was the man's child. So this law justified turning your back on your own offspring if you were white. Uh, it was easier to do if the law saw them as inferior and subservient to you. Uh, so the children of slave women were forever considered as slaves themselves and would work in the fields like anybody else. They had no special uh, privileges, okay, typically. Okay, so we talked about colonies and colonization so that's what we're talking about in this chapter colonies found in the new world so there's three types okay the first one is called tribute so, so the tribute colonies were found in mexico and south america not in the lands that would become the united states we'll talk about that first and we'll talk about the other two so tribute meant collecting goods from conquered people plantation large and agricultural to, to fill the demand for certain crops very key, use slave labor. Neo-European, modeled after European traditions that copied their patterns of economic and social organization. They wanted to duplicate a society that resembled the one that they had left. So the second two we find in America, typically plantation in the south, 
in Neo-European in the north because it's different geography, not the same you know place. They had different needs. Okay, so in the north, the Neo-European, you just simply start a colony and you you copy the the the, the place you came from. Okay, uh, in the south, it was different. They didn't have plantations in Europe, so the plantation uh, colonies were were different and new. But Neo-European were 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 modeled after European traditions. Okay. Let's talk about tribute first. Again, this is the only one of the three that did not happen in the lands that became the United States. But we still have to talk about it until we understand how this all fits together. Okay, so this is mostly Spain. Uh, this is the mid-1500 starts. Spain will, will be uh, in command of Mexico and South America and, and most of the uh, western part of the will become the United States for 300 years after conquering Mexico and Peru. Uh, a conqueror would receive what's called an encomienda from their monarch. Okay, so what's encomienda? It literally means to entrust a grant of Indian labor given by Spanish kings to prominent men. So it's usually a grant of land. These land grants were often quite vast. And whatever was on that land, that land grant, native cities, towns, communities, families, mines, Whatever it was, a plantation, whatever it was, became yours, and you were in control of those people, okay? Uh, so the, whoever the people were that were on your land grant became essentially your slave, okay? So encomienda uh, is part of this tribute colony idea, okay? So essentially, whatever was on that land became yours. So you see on the left here, the, the, what you would do is the indigenous people that were there that, that were now your slaves. They had to work and extract goods from the land and then give them to you. Okay, so here you see them dumping piles of gold at the feet of the uh, conquistadors that, that that got this encomienda. They're also called in, encomenderos. Okay, but to the right, I'm sorry, to the left. I'm sorry, you see the that they, these people were not treated very well. Th these people were subjugated and abused and oppressed. Okay, uh, so it's not it's not a, it's not a nice thing. So so in Amer in the Americas, the first encomiendas were handed out by Christopher Columbus in the Caribbean to his men for a job well done, and the people he had conquered. Remember the Arawaks, the Tainos, they now have to serve him and give him tribute. So the encomiendas were given to Spanish conquistadors, settlers, priests, or colonial officials, anybody that was part of the Spanish conquering the indigenous peoples of Mexico and South America. And these natives were forced to provide tribute, gold, silver, crops, foodstuff, pigs, llamas, whatever was on that land that, you, that the land grant came from, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, so what what did the encomendero? What was his responsibility to the to the people that were now his slaves? In return, the encomendero was responsible for the well-being of his subjects, to see to that the natives were converted and educated about Christianity. Okay, so in short, the system allowed these men to receive labor and products from the vanquished, and in return, they would receive religious instruction and protection. So it's kind of like paying off the mob, right? You you work for me and do what I say, and I'm going to oppress you and and abuse you, but I'll protect you, okay? Okay. So so as the conquistadors take hold in the new world, like like anywhere else people are, they they start to mix. So the Spanish were there for 300 years. So Mexico, South America became, becomes a mixed race society, okay? There are still people in these areas today that are indigenous, but but very few. Okay, most most people um, that come out of these areas are are have mixed descent. Okay, so what types are they? And these are names given to these people. Okay, so a mestizo would be a mix of a Spanish and a native. A mulatto would be a Spanish and an African. A zamba would be an Indian and an African. Okay. So just to be clear, I'm using the word mulatto here because your book did, which is kind of surprising. That's not really a word we use anymore. That's considered to be a uh, insulting word, uh, much like the N-word, 
much like the word Negro. It's it 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 uh, derives the idea of being subservient. But a mulatto, really, if you if you translate that, that that's a mule or an ass. So if you call someone a mulatto, you're calling them an ass. Okay, so we don't use that word. I'm using it here because your book did, uh, and as a way to to categorize that a mulatto was Spanish and African, we would say mixed race today. But of course, all these groups are mixed race. So I'll, I'll go ahead and use use this word for this slide. Okay. Okay. So so what so the Spanish take charge and they start this conversion converting indigenous people to Catholicism. You know, forget your old ways, become Spanish. Get rid of all your customs. Throw away your religion, your language, and become like us. Become Spanish. So these religious leaders were called friars or padres. So this is the name of the baseball, where the baseball team, the, the San Diego Padres, get their name. Okay, uh, they are honoring these these people. Okay, so we'll we'll learn a lot more about this practice conversion and all that as we as it appeared in America in the next few chapters here. But this is part of an idea that became known as Manifest Destiny, okay? Uh, also this process that became known as Americanization. So what is Manifest Destiny? It's the 19th century belief that the expansion of the United States throughout the American continents was both justified and inevitable. It's okay to do it and nobody can stop it. In fact, and this is the key part, it was ordained by God because these white Christian people were his favorite. So these people, these white Christian people, believed that they were God's chosen people and that God gave them to right to move across the land and make it their own uh, under any means necessary. Okay, uh, This will become a justification for some very cruel treatment of some people down the road. Okay. Okay, so that's that's tribute colonies. Okay, so so what I'm going to say now deviates a little from these three types of colonies, but to properly set up the other two plantation and neo-European, the two that were found in the America in, in, in America became the United States, we need some background information first. Okay, so going to uh, looking at the European uh, uh, culture. It was very much in the versus Spain in the 1500s, same era as the conquistadors, okay? Spain fought with England over power, wealth, religion. Religion because Protestant faith became popular. This created conflicts between Catholics and Protestants. These conflicts still, still go on to this day. Uh, Europe had become a confusing society, bickering amongst each other over religion, power, and they argued and fought over you know, by, by leaders who were incompetent, cruel, and selfish, okay? So so what's the issue between Protestants and Catholics? Uh, Catholicism and Protestantism are two de denominations of Christianity. In the Catholic Church, the Pope is the head of the church. This this, this is a human being, not, not a god, okay? Uh, so Protestantism is a general term that refers to Christianity that is not subject to the authority of the Pope or papal authority, okay? So the Protestants break away from the Catholics in an attempt to simplify the Christian faith. No Pope, no ceremonial, no uh, no pomp, and just make it much simpler and, and, and more for the common man, okay, or people, I should say. Okay. Okay. Um, so you have what's called the, the Reformation, 16th century, 1500s, the Protestant Reformation. So reforming, okay? So many faith groups split away from the Roman Catholic Church to reform themselves as Protestants. This, this action would destroy the relative dominance of Catholicism in Western Europe that they had had for uh, uh, probably a thousand years, okay? The, the area known as medieval or the dark ages or the middle ages Catholicism was the only religion the state religion it was harsh and strict and not not very nice to people okay it, it was it was it was dominating and and subjugating them okay so the Protestants break away because they don't want to be like that okay 
So, uh, so the Protestant Reformation is a religious, political, intellectual, and cultural upheaval. It changes the world, and it splinters Catholic Europe. Uh, and it really sets in place the structures and beliefs that would define the continent into the modern era, our era today. It's an attempt to reform the Roman Catholic Church and results in the creation of Protestant churches. So Protestant means to protest, okay? So the word Protestant means protest. What are you protesting? You're protesting the old ways of the Catholic Church, okay? So in Northern and Central Europe, you've got these reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, King Henry VIII. These, these men challenge papal authority or authority of the Pope. They question the Catholic Church's ability to, to define Christ, uh, the, the Christian practice. So the Reformation ended the dominance imposed by medieval Christianity in the eyes, like I said before, many historians signal the beginning of the modern era. It's the end of the medieval stronghold that religion had had on people. It led to a lessening of the strictness and harshness of religions prior to it. Uh, so all these issues led to many conflicts between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, and their differences would result in a major war, okay? So let's do supplemental election number two here. So we've done one. Now we should know, know what these are about. This is entitled Spain versus England, okay? And this is 1500, 16th century. Okay, so the king of Spain was Philip II, and he ruled vast territories of land, had unparalleled wealth from the New World, from plundering the Aztecs, Mayas, and Incas. On the other hand, England was a small country with little wealth, few friends, many enemies, okay? But they had a popular queen, Queen Elizabeth. And she was not afraid of Spain. Uh, she believed completely in the devotion and loyalty of her, of her people. And by believing in them, they believed in her. So they had, she had a very good relationship with her people. Uh, so going back 30 years prior to this era, relations between Spain and England had started well. Uh, Philip had even proposed marriage to Elizabeth, but, but she said no. So relations between the countries deteriorated over this period of these 30 years. So England's Protestant, Spain's Catholic. So again, this is a problem for Spain because this, this, these English have broken away from what was considered to be the accepted religion, and and this is this is this is a, a against their beliefs. Okay, so so the Spanish had an open hostility towards the English Queen Elizabeth. They believed she was illegitimate as a ruler and had no right to the English throne because she wasn't Catholic. So they, they had been involved in plots to dethrone her because they want to reinstate Catholicism in England, but they were, you know, uh, they, they failed to do that, okay? So as tensions are increasing, uh, uh, Elizabeth decides, I'm not going to just sit here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to instigate, okay? So she encourages the activities of English privateers uh, to raid Philip's ships as they make their way from the New World. Of course, these ships sunk down low in the water because they're full of gold. They're, they're, they're taking all the wealth, all the gold out of the New World. And, and, and Elizabeth knows this and sees this wealth coming back to Spain. So she, she hires privateers to go and raid these ships. Okay, so what's a privateer? Many of you will say a pirate, and you're right, partly, okay? A pirate is a, per, is, a, is a group of men uh, that's sailing on the high seas with a ship, and they raid and steal and plunder anybody, whether it's English, French, Portuguese, whatever it might be, okay? Whoever they run across in the high seas, they're going to raid and plunder, okay? A privateer does the same thing, but they're hired by one country to only raid another. So in this case... Uh, Elizabeth hires these privateers to only raid Spanish ships, and and they do. And as 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 Philip's ship make their way from Mexico and South America, full of gold and riches, the the English privateers plunder them and raid them and steal their riches, sink their ships, in in, in general disrupt their systems. Okay. Of course, this makes Philip very angry. You're you're taking away my my cash flow here, right? 
1585, Philip had enough, decides I'm going to build a great fleet called the Armada. And the purpose of this Armada is to invade England, uh, to depose Elizabeth, to defeat and conquer the English, and make England Roman Catholic once again. Okay. Not all the Spanish were, were okay with this and agreed with him. Some of them were adamantly against the invasion, but the king was convinced and had his way. So he's a king, not a president with the Congress to answer to, like we have in the United States today. Uh, when you're a monarch or a, you know a, a absolute authority, you do whatever you want. Nobody can stop you. Okay, so King Philip says we're going to attack uh, the English. That's the way that it was. Okay, so he starts to build this great fleet. They have a setback when one of the privateers, Sir Francis Drake, sails down to the coast of Spain and destroys many of these new ships that are being built. This, of course, weakens Spain's strength for an invasion, or at least he's trying to. Uh, but they kept going, and they end up having having a, this mighty fleet that they're going to now send against England. Okay, So the queen, Elizabeth, she's aware of this intended invasion of England by Spain for a for some time. She'd heard rumors of her for those 30 years. Uh, in the past, she easily dismissed them. Yeah, they're not going to come. But this time it's different. And it, be it became very clear to her that the Spanish were really going to send a fleet against England. And it it's on. Okay, so she employed all her efforts in raising funds to ensure that when the Spanish fleet came, England would be prepared. Okay, so May of 1588, the Armada uh, sets out. And the Spanish had a very sound plan. They had a fleet of over 100 ships, a very convincing force, okay? And what, what's, what's their plan? If you look at this map here, Spain's down here, England is up here, okay? This, this waterway between here is called the English Channel, okay? This, of course, would become very famous in World War II when the English crossed it to invade uh, France and liberate France and, and march on Hitler. That's a, that's a that's a uh, that's a story from another time. But same 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 waterway. So so the English Channel, very very narrow waterway between England and, the, and mainland Europe, and London is is just right 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 there, just inland from the coast a little bit. So Spain Spain just pretty simple. Come, um, we're going to come up. We're going to come into the Channel. Uh, the English Navy will meet us. We'll, we will destroy them in, in due order, and then we're gonna we're gonna march on London, capture it, and take over, and it's done. And so this is this is gonna be in their minds pretty easy, okay? Uh, okay, and and of course we're gonna we're gonna take that queen, that heretic queen. We're gonna capture her and depose her. So so what do I mean by heretic? And this is who they felt Elizabeth was. A heretic is a person holding an opinion that is at odds with what is generally accepted, especially in regards to religious doctrine. A heretic goes against religious doctrine. So typically a heretic is a person that's going against something religious, okay? So the Spanish are on their way, but the English were prepared. Elizabeth knew they were coming, and she had scouts on the cliffs of England and Wales, men that watched the, the, the seas day and night waiting for the first glimpse of the Armada. And they were told when they arrive, light these huge beacons, these huge lights on the cliffs and the hillsides. And that and those bright lights would send the message throughout the country that the Spanish were coming, the Spanish were here. So the beacons sent the message quicker than any horseman could ever arrive. So by morning, London and the Queen saw these lights and they knew that the day of the invasion had come. So as soon as the ships began to make their way up the English Channel, the fighting began, okay? So while the English soldiers and sailors fought for England and this battle starts, Queen Elizabeth made her way to the battlefield. She had determined that she was not going to hide inside a guarded palace while her people fought. She was going to live or die with them. So this is a pretty brave uh, moment for her. Most monarchs would hide in the palaces. Most would be men. But here, she doesn't do that, and she's a woman. So this, this of course, is a shocking moment as people see she's not afraid. I'm here with you. I support you. We can do this, okay? So upon a white horse, she inspects her soldiers at the in the town of Tilbury, England, which is just to, just south of London on the, on the coast of the English Channel. 
uh, I should, I'm sorry, just east of one on the, on the coast. And she made what was possibly her most famous speech, okay? And this is an excerpt from that speech. My loving people, we have been persuaded by some that are careful of our safety to take heed how we commit ourselves to armed multitudes for fear of treachery. Let tyrants fear. I have always so behaved myself that, under God, I have placed my chief strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. And therefore I am come amongst you all, as you see at this time, not for my recreation and disport, but being resolved in the midst and heat of the battle to live or die amongst you all to lay down for my God and for my kingdom and for my people, my honor and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, Elizabeth, please, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and a king of England too. And think foul scorn that Parma, so there, there's those brackets again. So so the the original quote does not have Duke of Parma, Netherlands in it. I put that in there under inside of brackets to tell you what Parma means. Okay, that's a Parma. She's referring to the Duke of Parma. Okay, and think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm. So not exactly an advocate of women's rights. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but this was a very impactful speech and very very inspiring to the English people. Uh, this whipped them up into a patriotic fervor, fury. They're, they were ready to go. So amazingly, as, the, as this, as this uh, battle begins and starts, the Spanish aren't doing so well. They thought they'd come in and just trample the English, but it's not going so well. The weather turned bad very suddenly. And the wind and rain came up and, and, the, and the seas were high waves and it was it was not not conducive to a battle okay of course the english just just go back to the coast because they live there they just go back and wait wait the storm out but the spanish are far from home they've got nowhere to go they are stuck in the in the channel they have to wait the the storm out in the water okay so most historians today believe that the storm was actually a hurricane which is unusual for a hurricane to happen and hit england but looking back on it, back on it from today, you know, uh, meteorological scientists see that that's what it probably was. Okay, so of course this creates total chaos for the Armada. Uh, they're getting bounced around, men are dying, ships are sinking. They are they are in total disarray. Okay, when the when the storm finally ends and the, and the seas calm down, they're they're scattered everywhere. And in, in no, you know, way are they organized. So the English send what are called fire ships and they aim them at them. So what do I mean by fire ships? A fire ship would be a ship that you're willing to sacrifice. You, you, you tie down the steering so it goes a, a specific direction straight ahead and you light the ship on fire. Of course, all these ships are made of wood. So by the time the ship is moving across the ocean on fire, you're, you're pointing at these Spanish ships that are in disarray and in some cases aren't able to even move. And you crash these fire ships into the Spanish ships. The second that they hit, all the burning lumber, the rigging falls on the Spanish ship. The Spanish ship goes up in flames, okay? So the combination of this storm and the fire ship were disastrous for the Spanish. And all these disadvantages went against them, and they were unsuccessful in their invasion, and they were soundly defeated by the English. Uh, this is an amazing moment, because nobody thought this would happen. This is an amazing moment in history, because no one thought the English had any, any shot at all of defeating the Spanish, but yet they do. Okay, The Spanish are, are in disarray. Many, many men wounded. Many men are, have died. Many ships have sunk. They they retreat and go home, but they couldn't go back the way they can because there were too many English ships down here. OK, so they have to go the long way home. Otherwise, they, they have to have another battle. If they went went to the English. So they go all the way around the British Isles, all the way 
tripling their their trip home to or at least to to come home. So this is this is a torturous journey. Many many men are 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 injured, you know, grievously. Many die. Pretty awful awful trip for them to come home. Okay. Uh, many did not make it back from Spain. So the battles over the English have won, and they're jubilant. They they they're they're beside themselves. They can't believe that they just did that. And so England is no longer considered to be a second-rate sea power anymore. They had conquered the fleet of the mighty Spanish Empire. Okay, uh, medals were made that said "God blew" and they were scattered. <clears throat> so again. Going back to that idea of God's favorite people that would become the mantra of the Western uh, uh, expansion movement in the Americas, this idea of God's favorite people, you could say start here, the Protestant people of, of, of England. Now remember, this, this, was, this was, was religiously motivated. This is Catholics versus, versus Protestants. The Protestant people saw this as the, the work of a Protestant God, the Protestant God came in and, and this storm came from God to help them. So God blew and they were scattered, meaning they, meaning the Spanish ships. So it was an act of God to, to please and help his favorite people. Okay. So that, so the, so the Protestant people from the very early you know stage believe that they are God's favorite people. Okay. Okay. So Elizabeth is victorious. English, God bless you, my people, she calls out, and they heaped blessings on her, okay? So the defeat of the Spanish Armada by England is legendary in not only English history, but in world history. This is the turning point in history. The ships, uh, uh, it signals a, a shift in power amongst European nations, okay? Uh, the defeat of the Spanish Armada was the queen's finest hour. She had been called the savior of the English people. Now it seemed that this is what she had really become. She had led her people to glory, defeating Spain. She didn't hide in the palace. It's a big moment. And and they defeat Spain, the greatest power in the 16th century world. Okay. So this is where England becomes a world power. Okay. So why is this important to American history? So this is the relevance of the lecture. Okay. It marked the rise of England as a world power. They would become the world power, and it starts with this victory. Why is that important? Because, because of this victory, they gain confidence to venture across the Atlantic and become a player in the new world that they had stayed out stayed out of until this, this moment, okay? And of course, this would they would come to dominate American colonization, dominate the new world, and after their defeat of France in 1763, that would lead them as the European nation in control of what is today the eastern half of the United States. So you see these 13 colonies here. The relevance of the lecture is England comes to power after this after this Spanish Armada. They come to the New World and start the calling that would later become the United States. Okay. Okay, that's the end of that supplemental lecture. Okay. So just briefly some of the main points. Uh, Spain and England had issues over being Catholic and Protestant. Uh, the, the Spanish were wealthy from plundering the New World. Uh, Elizabeth sent privateers to raid Spanish ships. In response, King Philip built a fleet called the Spanish Armada to invade England. Uh, they wanted to depose the king and to restore Catholicism. Uh, they felt that, that, that she had no right to the throne and was illegitimate. England was small and not wealthy, so they, it was a big uh, you know, challenge for them to fight the Spanish. They knew the invasion was coming and prepared themselves for it. May 1588, the Armada heads out towards England, but England's prepared. They send warnings from these beacons when the Armada was sighted. The Queen goes to the battle site gave it to rally the troops, gave an inspiring speech at Tilbury. Uh, and, and after that, a huge storm, probably a hurricane, ruined Spain's chances. That, coupled with fire ships, defeated Spain. In retreat, Spain lost many men. Uh, relevance. Why is this important to American history? This is the point where England rises to become a world power, and they look to the new world to colonize. They ended up being the last European power standing in North America. The English colonies is where the United States was born. Okay. Okay, so that kind of sets the stage for 
of what happens in uh, the Americas, okay? The, the English bring their ways with them and the English rise to power, okay? Okay, so our second, so going back to our list of three different types of colonies, our second colony is called plantation colony, okay? Colonies. And I mentioned this a little bit in chapter one, okay? This this island of South, so 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 here you see the difference, okay, versus North and South. The North didn't have land like this, okay. So when we get to the Neo-European colonies, this is why they're different. The South had vast lands of fertile fertile lands getting fed by the by the river, the Mississippi, with nutrients and mineral. This is a this is one of the you know uh, most uh, uh, the best land in the world for growing. Uh, and and the the Europeans realized for English early on that plantations with slave labor can be very profitable. Okay, so this idea came from the island of Sao Tome. So going back to chapter one, I talked about the Portuguese, and up up here, and they're they're coming around Africa to get to get to Asia because they want those Chinese goods. But along the way, they they look and well, wait a minute, there's some opportunity here because there's slaves here, and people are taking slaves out of here. In fact, Africans are taking Africans as slaves. The African, the African slave trade had been going on for hundreds of years before the Europeans showed up. So the idea that the white people brought slavery to Africa is incorrect. The the Africans were enslaving each other. Okay, um, initially. Okay, so the Portuguese the Portuguese get involved in this, and they start taking slaves, and they have this idea about this plantation. Let's start a sugar plantation on this little tiny island called Sao Tome. And they do. And they start this sugar plantation there and they and they get these slaves from the from the uh, inland areas here to be the labor source. And and they did very well. They they made a lot of money and, and it worked well and and you know wow this this is a great idea. Okay. So so these these plantations in the future, uh, these profitable plantations in the South and the Caribbean, South America that, that are coming, all of them were inspired by this little island off the coast of Africa called Sao Tome. They uh, duplicate what the Portuguese did, and, and they all got very, very wealthy. I mean, how, how, how bad could it be when you don't have to pay anybody for this very tough and and you know uh, brutal labor. Okay, imagine if you owned a business with a hundred people today, and you didn't have to pay them anything, and you'd you'd make quite a bit of money. Okay, so so this is kind of so Sao Tome is is the inspiration for the plantation society that develops in the New World. Okay, so I mentioned before a colony does two things to to get the the raw goods out of the land and to use the indigenous people as a labor source. Okay. So if that's the case, then why didn't the Europeans use Native Americans as their labor source? Why would they choose to go all the way to Africa and bring people from there? Okay. Well, again, going back, we talked about disease. Disease killed 90% of the native population. So there weren't enough of them around. So the Amer so in America, the Europeans chose Africans to be their labor force. I mean, it must be nice to choose a race that will be your free labor source, right? Against their will, of course. So it's a, it's ironic. On the one hand, the European diseases had little to do with the Africans becoming slaves, but on the other hand, African slavery was a direct result of it. Okay. So, so again, England had been slow getting started in the New World. They hadn't been a player on the international stage. Uh, many other countries were getting rich in the New World, specifically Spain, of course. But with the defeat of Spain, England has more confidence, and they come, and they come to the New World. Okay, But initially, they had some failures. Okay, The first English colony was called uh, Roanoke. Okay, this is the, the Roanoke Island Colony, the first English settlement in the New World. Uh, this colony was founded by a man named Sir Walter Raleigh, okay, in August of 1585. Uh, and this, this colony was in existence between 1585 and 1590, okay? 
uh, this colony would become known as the Lost Colony of Roanoke. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, why is it, was it called that? Well, the first colonists did not fare very well. And suffering from dwindling food supplies and Indian attacks, in 1586, a year later, probably less, they returned to England aboard a ship captained by Sir Francis Drake of Spanish Armada fame. Uh, okay, so, but they decided to come back. 1587, Sir Walter Raleigh sent out another group of 100 colonists under the uh, leadership of John White. So White was the governor of the Roanoke Island Colony. And this is not Roanoke, Virginia. This is in present-day North Carolina, okay? So so White returns. So uh, Okay, so they come. They get set up. They, they go to the same colony that, that they had started before, and they get them set up. White then decides, I'm going to return to England to procure more, more supplies. Uh, but this war with Spain, the Armada, delayed his return to, to Roanoke, okay? Uh, so when he finally returned, from a supply trip to England that, that should have taken six, seven, eight months. It's three years later. He, he finally returns in 1590, okay? And he comes up to the colony, and he finds that it's deserted. There's no people there. Everyone had vanished. There was literally no one there. The colony was there, all the buildings, all their tools, all their stuff, but no people, no no trace of the hundred or so colonists that White left behind. There was no sign of violence. There was nothing burnt. There were no bodies. There were no skeletons, nothing, you know, like that. It, they just simply weren't there, okay? The only clue to their mysterious disappearance was the word Croatoan that was carved into a palisade of, of the fence. Now, so a palisade is a fence of wooden stakes um, the kind of fixing the ground that they form an enclosure around a fort. So a typical forts got got you know it's, it's it's trees side by side. That's the palisade. So somebody somebody carved the word Croatoan in one of the palisades. So that was a clue perhaps. Uh, so White takes this Croatoan as this word. This has meant that the colonists had moved to Croatoan Island, 50 miles away. Okay. But a later search of, of the Croatoan Island found none of the settlers. So these people were never really found. No one to this day knows what became of them, okay? The History Channel and, and Discovery and a and &E and all these, all these channels have always have some kind of new evidence about the lost island of Roanoke. Most of them are inaccurate. We don't know what happened. There are some, there are some evidence, and, people, and, and there truly are scholars that are working on this, but we don't know what happened to these people, okay? Okay, so Jamestown is the next um, English attempt, okay? 1607. So 17 years after the failures of Roanoke. Uh, so they waited a long time. That's a long time. And and the people in Jamestown struggled at first also. Uh, they would ultimately be helped by Native Americans. They would have died without the help from the indigenous people. These people came for gold, and they were ill-equipped to survive the winters. They didn't understand that we have to plant food for the winter. We have to have water source. We have to have, you know, shelter. They just, they, they thought because of what they'd seen Spain doing, that they thought that we're going to come here and pick up gold nuggets off the ground. Well, that's not the way Virginia is, okay? that's that's That didn't work out, okay? So it goes very poorly for them, and they they end up, having what's called the starving times, the, the winter, they're freezing to death, many people die, uh, exposure, and in some cases there's evidence perhaps that they were that they were um, eating each other, okay, uh, cannibalism, there's a there's a there's some evidence that a man actually killed his wife so he could he could he could you know use her as a food source, okay? Uh, you do incredibly incredible things when you're desperate for your life, okay? Uh, and it's the natives that come in and help them and teach them how to grow and harvest and how to survive winters, okay? Uh, so that that survives them. I mean that that means that they they didn't all die because they because the natives stepped in. But it really is the introduction of a crop from the Caribbean called tobacco, 
This saves the day. Suddenly, this tobacco was becomes very popular. It grows, turns out, it grows very, very well in Virginia, North Carolina. To this day, it does. So tobacco saves the day. Uh, and it grows everywhere, and, and, and tobacco is spreading across the land. So what happens when you when your tobacco plantation spreads across the land, and then your neighbor's got one, and, he, and his neighbor's got one? There's tobacco everywhere. The Native Americans that lived there were pushed out. So you start to have some conflicts. Who are these people, and why are they pushing us out? Okay, But tobacco saves the day, and people start to come, and free land is offered to lure people to go. Free land that really wasn't theirs, but they didn't, they didn't have any respect for the native people that they had rights to anything that just take what we want. OK, uh, so so more people came. The population swells to forty five hundred and all the population and the pushing out of the natives starts a 10 year conflict with Native Americans. OK, and you have different colonies that, that, that begin to. Uh, start in the in the in the Americas. 1634, Lord Baltimore, so the city that Baltimore comes from, uh, founds the the uh, colony of Maryland, and this is a Catholic colony. So so wait a minute. I thought we were at odds with the Catholic. Well, again, America's about freedom of religion. Even early on, even before there's a country, you have different colonies practicing different religions. Okay. Uh, of course, the, of course, the Catholics. You know, we're at odds with the English. Okay, so so you have some problems, but they pass what are called the Toleration Acts, and this is this again is an is an early example of that the people that came to America are different. They're they're going to allow religious toleration. So the Toleration Act supported Catholics in in Maryland. It guaranteed toleration to all Christians. Okay, uh, death was upon those to deny. Jesus. So maybe not quite as benevolent as we'd like, but at least they're getting there, okay? So this is the precursor to freedom of religion, to allow all types of worship, not just a state church, okay? Okay, so so you have this tobacco, this land, you've got this uh, you've got this agricultural product that that everybody wants. Everybody wants tobacco from the New World. So you have a need of labor, okay? So we talked about the natives were were diminished too much. Africans came, but before the Africans came as slaves, I shouldn't say came; they were brought. Uh, the system of indentured servitudes, indentured service, was used. So indentured servants initially bound their employers in exchange for a free passage to the New World. So what does that mean? It means that uh, that English men, mostly men, 75% men, but women too. English or European men and women, they would agree to work for somebody for four or five years without pay, room and board, um, and in return, they would get free passage. So work for four or five years, I will give you free passage, room and board. At the end of the contract, you could then marry. Many times you would receive land from the, from the landowner who paid your passage. And that was how it worked. These are white people, okay? Now, not to, to be to be truthful. Many of these people were abused also, mistreated, especially women. Okay. So, so how, how did it go to, from this to African, uh, African labor? Uh, a drop in tobacco prices. Why would that happen? Everybody wanted it because everyone's growing it. And when you have, when you have a, uh, abundance of a product, what happens to, to its price? It, it drops. Okay. It's the, the old economic law of supply and demand. If if uh, if you have a whole bunch of something and nobody wants it, the price drops. Okay, so that that's what happens. This results in the in the planters going to slavery because there's more profit. Okay, because you, you, once you once you bought the person, you, you paid for the person, and that was it. You didn't have to pay anything more. Okay, so that, so it became more profitable. This is also where skin color became an identifying factor as to your social status. This is a new feature regarding slavery. Slavery has been around since since the very beginning of time, all the way through the history of humans, all the way to the early, early ancient civilization, there had been slavery. But it wasn't until the Americas that slavery became about the color of your skin, identifying your, you, uh, your social status, and became lifetime. Okay, Typically a slave in the prior to this, a slave was a prisoner of war or a convict, 
or some kind of person that was, you know, uh, in trouble for something, they would be enslaved for a period of time, then set free. Okay. The idea of lifetime slavery based on the color of your skin starts in the Americas. Okay. Okay. That is the end of the plantation era, or I'm sorry, plantation colonies. Okay. So let's talk about Neo-European. So, so again, you, you, you duplicate. So here's on the on the right, you've got you've got uh, a, a town in Amsterdam, Dutch, and they come to the New World and they replicate it. And this is called New Amsterdam, which would, of course be, would become New York City. Okay, uh, they want to replicate Europe. They want to reproduce the exact society they were accustomed to in Europe. Makes sense, familiarity. Okay, so New England, New York, New Amsterdam, New France, New Netherlands. All named after cities and countries back in Europe. They want to copy the social and e economic system that they were used to. Okay, so New France is a good example of a neo-European colony. Okay, so let's do our next supplemental lecture number three here, and this is called the French and the Natives. Okay, so go ahead and get ready for, to take notes for this. Okay, okay, so the French colony was called <coughs> New France. Northern New York, upstate New York, and Canada, mostly fur trappers. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see by the map here, the French are in blue, but that's misleading. They, that, they had control of that land, but most of it, most of the population is centered along the St. Lawrence River here, Quebec, Montreal, right here. All the rest of this was very sparsely populated, okay? On the other hand, the English have small land. This up here, also very very sparsely populated not not part of the equation okay but this part here of the English was was hugely popular overpopulated they they were kind of hemmed in by the mountains the Appalachians here and they were stuck against the coast okay so New France is is inland from the English but their but their entrance and access to land is by the waterway here, the St. Lawrence River. What's key about that is the St. the St. Lawrence River connects to the Great Lakes and connects to the Ohio and the Mississippi. You can have, you can get all the way to, all the way from New Orleans from the from the St. Lawrence River. The, the English didn't have that kind of strategic land. Okay, this will come into play as we get later on in the course here. Okay, mostly fur trappers, the the French. Okay, and they're looking for beaver. Beaver pelts were used to manufacture hats for European men. These hats were very very popular. Uh, and I wear one all the time. Get only get get compliments when I do. Okay, so very popular hats. Okay, huge market for beaver pelts in Europe, and and they would trade with the natives for pelts. Pelts again to make these stylish hats. So a consequence of the fur trade was exploration, European exploration deep into unknown territory. Of course, not unknown to the people that were there, unknown to the Europeans. They'd never been there before. So the fact that they're looking for for uh, fur opportunities took them inland where they were able to see what was going on and they would make maps so other people knew, okay? So these men go deep into the interior. They find lakes, rivers, mountains, mountain chains, different tribes. They come back with maps, however crude, and people began to have a understanding of what was out there, okay? So these were the first explorers of the new world, these fur trappers. Uh, now, we, we talked about there were hostilities between the early American colonists and the natives for obvious reasons. Back in Jamestown, the, the, the lands were being encroached upon as these white civilizations spread, okay? So we talked about the English a little bit. So the English, in particular, had a horrible relationship with the natives. They, they, they treated them as inferior. <clears throat> they, they downright hated them, <clears throat> okay? They believed that these natives stood in the way of, again, their God-given right to the land in America. So you could say that the English despised them. They wanted to, to subject the natives to their laws as they established their colonies. They wanted them to adopt their ways, their language, their religion, and, and lose your own. They also wanted to exterminate them, remove them from the picture. And, and we'll learn in this class how they did that, okay? We talked about the Spanish and the natives. Indians. The Spanish didn't have any better relationships at all. They, they with the encomenderos, they, they were worse, right? They, they enslaved them and brutalized them in Mexico and South America. Uh, later, they would come north and establish the mission system in California, 
And in California, they forced the natives to convert from their traditional religions to Catholicism. They were treated cruelly, enslaved, subjugated. So the natives did not appreciate any of this, okay? So two European countries that were hugely ethnocentric in their approach to different peoples that were not like them. An example of, of European ethnocentrism or a Eurocentric point of view. It's all about us, okay? But the French were a notable exception to this. The French were nice to the Indians. Uh, they enjoyed excellent relations with them almost from the very beginning. So why were the French different? Uh, they did not try to change the natives. They did not compete with them for land. They recognized the native culture as was diverse, not all the same, like, like the English and Spanish did. They became the only European power to try and understand it, okay? So when the, when the French first came in the 1530s and 40s, they came for fur trading. Uh, and, so, and they established, established strong trading ties with the local natives they found there. And the natives, of course, dealt extensively in furs. They start this, this kind of uh, partnership and relationship, okay? Uh, Giovanni de Verrazzano was an Italian explorer, but he worked for the French king. So he, he's famous for charting the Atlantic coast of North America between the Carolinas and Newfoundland, including New York Harbor in 1524. The Verrazzano Narrows Bridge in present-day New York is named after him. But these are, these are two direct quotes from him in describing the Narragansett tribe when he first encountered them, okay? Now, now compare this to the quotes we saw about Columbus in chapter 1. They exceed us in size. They are of a very fair complexion. Some incline more to a white and others to a tawny color. Their faces are sharp and their hair long and black, upon the adorning of which they bestow great pains. Their eyes are black and sharp. Their express, expressions mild and pleasant, greatly resembling the antique. Okay, so so not insulting, not we can subjugate them, not we can you know, enslave them. He's 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 giving them compliments, right? Uh, in a later letter to the King of France, Verrazzano wrote that the Narragansett tribe are the most beautiful and have the most civil customs that we found on this voyage. So from the very beginning, the French were not threatened by the natives, nor did they see them as an enemy. Uh, so the French quickly discovered, because of their good relations, that they could go back to France in the winter months with ships full of furs, you know, many they had received from trade with the natives. And they knew that their, that their possessions in the New World were safe because their native friends would, would take care of them. So, so they have this pretty good deal going on, okay? And, and they would trade other things also. Uh, the, the, the natives wanted European wares, metal cooking pots, weapons, you know, other, other goods not accessible to the natives at, at that time. Horses. So it's important to understand horses were not in, in, the, uh, in the Americas until the, in, until the Europeans brought them. So the Europeans bring horses. This dramatically changed the lives of natives. They became better hunters, more effective in battles. They could travel further and set up new trade opportunities, okay? So the French accompanied the natives on their hunting parties, and they learned how to become very uh, good fur trappers, okay? They hunted alongside the natives. The natives showed the French where the good fur animals could be found. So the French also made it a point to learn the native languages and ways, which was very different than the others. They established good relations. They were based on equality with all the tribes in the area. Even the king of France, King Louis XIII, declares the ordinance of 1627. <clears throat> they claim that natives who had converted to Catholicism would be considered as natural Frenchmen. So it had to be about conversion still, okay, but they were friendly about it, okay? This is a quote from the king. This is from this ordinance. The descendants of the French who are accustomed to this country, New France, together with all the Indians who will be brought to the knowledge of the faith and will profess it, shall be deemed and renowned natural Frenchmen, and as such may come to live in France when they want and acquire, donate, and succeed and accept donations and legacies just as true French subjects without being required to take no letters of declaration of naturalization. Okay, so this is astonishing. This is the direct opposite of how the English and Spanish 
be the natives. They would never um, consider allowing the natives to integrate into their societies because in their mind they were they were inferior and they should be they should remain in that subservient role and slave and we should remove them and exterminate them. But the French didn't feel that way. The French said, yes, you can become a natural Frenchman if you convert to Catholicism, okay? The other thing the French didn't do that the English did is encroach on their lands. So when the when the French built their permanent settlement at Quebec, 1608, Quebec is still still there today, a very relevant Canadian city. Uh, this is this is one year after the English founded Jamestown and started to encroach, right? When when they built when the French built Quebec, they did not encroach on on native lands or displace anybody in the establishment of it. They continued to work closely with them and work with them in the fur trade. So they respected native territories, their ways, and treated them as human beings. Uh, in turn, the Indians treated the natives, I'm sorry, the French, as trusted friends. The French made attempts, it's this, this, is, this is unusual, the French made attempts to alleviate the diseases the natives were experiencing from, because of contact with the early European explorers. So all this disease that, of course, was a, a lucky stro a stroke of good luck for the English, and, and they were happy to see them all die, the French thought, let's try to help them. Let, let's try to cure them, okay? Uh, so very, a very unique relationship was formed from the very beginning. And, and of course, these, these people mix, and the French intermarried with the Indians, okay? Uh, much more than any other European group. And most of these marriages were an alliance based on mutual respect, good treatment from both sides, okay? Many French trappers had two families, one with a white wife in France and one with a native wife in America, and each that included children in the family. Now, I don't, I don't suppose that either one knew about the other, but that's the way that they, that they did it. But, but the point is that, that they felt that, that comfortable with them, okay? So this good relationship led to the native, let the natives decide with the French in their conflicts with the English settlers, okay? Uh, this would come later in the 1600s into the mid-1700s. Uh, so as long as the French maintained settlements in America, they enjoyed excellent relations with the natives, with each other, okay? Uh, so like, like all the rest, though, the French were also missionaries. Uh, and like I said earlier, this is a, we'll, we'll find this is a very important aspect uh, of the presence of white Europeans in the New World. Uh, the French wanted to convert the natives to Catholicism, okay? Uh, they wanted to spread Catholicism. So you, 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 could, you, could, you could say that this pursuit is also an indication of ethnocentrism, our way is the only way, but they approached it in a much more benevolent way, okay? Okay, so so what is the relevance of this lecture? So going back to that map where the, where the blue was a whole lot more than the red, a lot more French land than English land, uh, but like I said, sparsely populated. The, the French didn't have very many people at all. The English did. So the English outnumbered the French considerably when it came to war. But because the French had good relations with the natives, most of the native tribes, not all, most sided with the French. That that kind of leveled the numbers out a little bit and gave them more people to fight against the English when the French and Indian Wars would come, okay? Okay, that is the end of that lecture. Uh, quick, Quickly, the main points. Uh, the French colony was called New France, upstate New York, Canada, fur trappers hunting for beaver. The natives had had bad relations with the English and the Spanish, but good with the French. Uh, Giovanni de Verrazzano described them nicely. Uh, the French accepted native ways and not try to change them. They traded and hunted, hunted together. Even the king said that they could be called, they, they could become natural Frenchmen if they convert to Catholicism. Uh, they would be welcome in France. Of course, England or Spain would, would never allow that. Uh, French built Quebec without encroachment on native lands, as opposed to Jamestown, where they, where they did that with tobacco. Intermarriages happening based on mutual respect. A trapper could have a family in France, a family in America. 
uh, the French also did missionary work to, to spread Catholicism. Okay, so what's the relevance? The the uh, the fact that most of the natives sided with the French evened up the numbers uh, when they came to the French and Indian War because the English had had much more population than the French did. Okay, okay, uh, that is that, and let's uh, end end with that here. And well, this is the end of part one of chapter two, and then we'll go to part. And so go ahead and and go to part two. Okay, thank you.